very soon and uh, the this afternoon session is is relatively short because um, we have one presentation Fred Hawker is going to facilitate the session this afternoon so we will start um, with the first presentation and then there's the panel Fred will will run through exactly how all of that is going to work and just a reminder that when the session ends at 3.15. Um, you're going to need to gather your stuff, go to the bathroom, um, get your buddies, and we will begin to make our way down. We can, we can meet, there's a train car outside Pier 21. Uh, you would have seen it when you, you entered the building this morning. So I think that's a good place to begin gathering. And our plan is to do our best to be at the Blue Nose, which is right outside on the water of the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic where we were last night. So if you weren't there and you lose, you lose the pack, just keep walking along the wooden board walk that way. It will probably take you, well, if you're fast, you can probably do it in about 12 minutes. Um, but otherwise, if you want to stroll a little bit longer, your goal is to get there by four so you can have the briefing. And like I said, don't worry if you're on the second sale. We will look after you. Uh, you can have a chance to, to explore the, the exhibits at the museum or have some snacks. And um, yeah, OK. I'm going to just hand it over to Fred. Good afternoon and welcome to the, the second session of the day. My name is Fred Hawker. I'm uh, the ringmaster wrangler for this uh, and I'll try to keep things moving along so we can all get to sailing on the big fishing schooner. That's the highlight of my day. So uh, I'd like to welcome our first speaker. Uh, we have one presentation uh, and then a panel discussion. I'll cover that when we get there. Uh, Jeremy Meichel. It, he reminds me it is Mitchell, not Mitchell, uh, is the head of a curatorial group at Royal Museums Greenwich, which is responsible for many things such as uh, photographic and ship plans, ship models, uh, etc. Cuddy Sark as well. Uh, he also has within his remit collections regarding polar exploration, which is what he's going to address today. Jeremy? Um, thank you very much, um, and having had that introduction, that shortened my talk by at least two minutes, so thank you. Um, so the focus of this talk uh, has broadened since I originally wrote the uh, proposal, uh, as my thoughts had developed on the topic of Canada as a cultural gateway, and it's moved away from being a focus on just the Inuit material uh, from the Franklin 1845 expedition and the subsequent searches to look at all of the First Nations material uh, from across northern Canada, and hopefully this will become clear. If I can get this to work. Has it changed? Yeah. It has. Excellent. Um, England and later Britain's interest in the Canadian Arctic regions goes back to the late 1400s, but the concerted drive to explore, map, analyse what is now northern Canada and the Canadian archipelago really began in 1818 after the war with France. And it started with Captain John Ross uh, and his sea-based expedition, uh, which was seen as a little bit of a failure because he discovered some mountains that didn't exist uh, and was never let, um, allowed to forget, uh, forget it. And then, of course, over the next 30 years, there were successive uh, expeditions into the Canadian Arctic, um, mapping and uh, searching for uh, a route through uh, a Northwest Passage. But then in 1848, this changed, uh, and it became one searching for people and then gathering information about what happened to those people. But this drive wasn't solely by ship. There are a number of overland expeditions uh, by officers and men from the Hudson's Bay Company, such as Simpson, Dees, and Ray, which utilized the networks of trade routes and outposts set up along rivers and routes within the interior. And companies like the HBC and the Northwest Company were also tasked to support the Royal Navy overland expeditions by John Franklin and George Back, and they achieved this with varying degrees of success uh, or not. 
The vastness of the northern interior of Canada took them also away from these normal trading routes, uh, and that meant that they had to rely on uh, the First Nation groups living within these areas uh, to supply and support them. Uh, the lack of planning from these expeditions and the lack of proper coordination with First Nations has been dramatically illustrated by John Franklin's account from his first overland expedition, where actually they were only saved by the indigenous people from starvation. And while the man who ate his boots may have earned a heroic status back in Britain, it really just disguised the fact that the expedition had been very poorly planned to start with. Those who traveled further north tended to do so in much smaller groups and could integrate more readily, although not every overland expedition did so. John Ray, a Hudson's Bay Company employee, and the Americans Charles Hall and Frederick Schwatka were three exponents of working closely with Inuit communities. Their expeditions were wide-ranging, including surveying, searching for Franklin and his men after 1848, collecting oral testimony about Franklin and Inuit culture, and researching uh, and searching for Franklin expedition objects. To do this successfully, they adapted to Inuit practices in dress, travel, diet, and ultimately living in the Arctic for extended periods of time. It was a different matter at sea. The sea routes into the Arctic relied on two main entry points, Hudson's Bay and Lancaster Sound. Although in 1818, Ross initially had reported the Croker Mountains cutting across the bottom of Lancaster Sound, the map shows here how many of the early expeditions used Hudson's Bay as the entry point to finding a Northwest Passage until after 1818, when Ross and then William Parry and others started to explore further north using Lancaster Sound as their route. Of course, Lancaster Sound was the main focal point searching for Franklin after he failed to reappear in 1848, and I would like to say he wasn't lost. They knew where they were. They were only lost to the people back at home. Not only was Lancaster Sound the gateway for explorers and, and searchers, but the published accounts uh, also opened up the natural resources of uh, this area of the Arctic. So whalers started to use Lancaster Sound as their seasonal areas to go for catching whales. These expeditions were sea-based and were not designed to live off the land in the same way that Inuit did through seasonal migration, where resources existed. As such, encounters with indigenous peoples would be sporadic, depending on where the ships ended up. Captains Edward Parry and John Ross encouraged encounters with Inuit. It was an opportunity to work with them as interpreters, geographers, and suppliers of local knowledge and also to supply equipment, as well as being a relief from the tedium of being trapped in uh, the ice over winter. Admittedly, some officers were less open-minded than others. And Parry actually tried to note down their music and songs, which he then published in his accounts back in England. The importance of this local knowledge is illustrated in the practice of taking Inuit interpreters, uh, and how some of the officers attempted to learn the language when they were searching for Franklin. These numerous overland and sea-based expeditions by the Royal Navy and the trade encounter and exploration of officers and men of the Hudson's Bay Company resulted in First Nations and Inuit material culture being brought back to the United Kingdom, where it is scattered across different museums, galleries, and scientific institutions. For instance, you can see a lovely collection of Inuit ivory and soapstone sculptures at the Stromness Museum in Orkney, collected by Orcadians who had worked in the whaling industry or were employees of the HBC when their ship stopped off at Stromness on the way to Greenland and Canada. Knowledge exchange between First Nations and European contemporaries wasn't consistent or even on an equal footing, or properly understood, being colored by the prejudices of the time. However, it has left a legacy for both Britain and Canada to address. The National Maritime Museum holds both Inuit and First Nations related material. The latter was mostly collected by George Back on one of uh, the many uh, overland expeditions that uh, he went on between 1819 and 1835, consisting of elegantly made and decorated moccasins, mittens, octopus bags and snow goggles, and his Athabascan type snowshoes. Examples of these are on the right of the image. We were fortunate a few years ago to be able to reunite the whole collection. For some strange reason, the family had literally split the collection of one moccasin went to, into the family and the other moccasin went into the old Royal Naval Museum. And we were able to reunite it back so we could actually put both pairs of uh, moccasins and so on on display. However, the bulk of our material 
uh, relates to um, the Franklin search expeditions between 1852 and 1880. The material collected from these expeditions was transferred to us from the old Royal Naval Museum in Greenwich when the NMM was founded in 1934. The collection is quite large, made up, as you can see, of adapted tools and hunting weapons repurposed by different Inuit groups from the search expeditions that were encountered, interviewed, and then bartered with. There, there was, on some occasion, uh, pilfering, which seemed to be okay for the naval officers to do, but not for Inuit when they wanted something that was useful to them. The photographs of Greenland Inuit at the bottom uh, were taken by Captain Inglefield in 1854, so they're the second earliest uh, collection of uh, Arctic photographs that we have, um, and they're taken on glass plate negatives using the wet plate process. More recently, in 2020, we acquired a small collection of late 20th century Inuit soapstone sculptures from uh, Sir Ranald Fiennes, uh, who had purchased these with his late wife Ginny on their numerous Arctic expeditions. And the display of some of these items has helped us to start addressing both the historic and contemporary stories within the uh, museum. Not all the collection is from British expeditions. A significant number, including Inuit material, was sent to the Admiralty after the US expedition led by Schwatka between 1878 and 1880. Historically, the material has been used in a very Brito-centric way where the Franklin expedition drives the narrative. The Inuit material included adapted tools, was either displayed as evidence of the disaster or as ethnographic curios to be displayed in different museums. However, none of this gave a voice to Inuit, a process that has begun to change in the museum, illustrated by the embedding of Inuit stories and culture within our Polar Worlds Gallery, which my colleague Claire Warrior and I worked on. The aims to bring their culture to a wider audience that is mostly unfamiliar with who they are and how they adapted to live in the Arctic uh, regions, as well as the challenges they now face economically and in light of climate change. Collectively, UK institutions house rich and diverse Canadian indigenous material, which can tell multiple and varied stories. However, collaboration between these organisations can be project-focused, fleeting, or based on personal connections between individual curators and archivists. Canada, therefore, having been a gateway for exploration and exchange of physical objects, is in a position to continue that role, but with the flow of intellectual ideas, cultural exchange, and uh, project collaboration. The individual expertise and networks within the UK and Canadian institutions and indigenous communities should be given the opportunity to facilitate the improvements of our collective understanding of the stories, context, and cultural significance of all of our collections. And this was highlighted to me when we hosted in 2017 Death in the Ice about the 1845 expedition. As a Canadian Museum of History instigated exhibition, it was predominantly written from a Canadian perspective. However, for a British audience, we reduced the explanation of the British Admiralty and Navy, but we had to increase the text about Inuit, their culture, and the vital role that they played in our understanding of the fate of Franklin's expedition. The collaboration between us and the Canadian Museum of History and Parts Canada illustrated how combining our areas of knowledge about objects and cultural context created a much richer experience for a British audience. And it also gave me the opportunity to upgrade our catalogue records. We've been fortunate also to work with the Canadian High Commission, and they were very active in supporting the Polar Worlds Gallery. However, what it illustrated to me was that that working relationship was project focused, and it's about now moving that into the next stage of having something more sustained. Without an Inuit and First Nations diaspora in Britain, it becomes even more important to create and sustain these networks across the Atlantic. Canada and its various institutions becomes an important part of that ambition, creating an atmosphere of mutual support with a free flow of ideas and knowledge. These objects and illustrations, whether in the NMM or elsewhere, still have much to say about encounter and exchange, adaption and ingenuity and cultural identity but the richness of their stories can only be harnessed if there is an opportunity for the relevant communities to become involved. And that's the challenge for curators like me to begin with as a dialogue. So to practice what I'm preaching, I'm off to Ottawa next week to meet the curators of the Canadian Museum of History to discuss this, as well as meet the conservator working on the Erebus and Terra Rex, where they hold items uh, pulled up from the wrecks that are, uh, that are going to go on display, but they haven't yet had that discussion as to where. 
It'll be a long process to establish these relationships and embed them in a natural working pattern, but I'm hoping that this will be the first step of a dynamic process. So if anyone wants to get involved, please feel free to come and talk to me. And I did remember to bring business cards because I normally forget. So thank you very much. Thank you.